Okay, I, I believe we're recording now. All right, so um, how are you guys doing? Okay, how, um, how did homework one go? Um, I'm not sure how to take that response. Uh, I've posted homework two, and, uh, and homework two is a doozy, all right? It's, um, it's pretty tough. So uh, there's two parts to it. A again, this is a programming class, and so there's a lot of coding involved, right? A lot of programming. So uh, there's two parts to it. One is the uh, RMD file, um, kind of like homework one where I give some tasks and you just write the, uh, the commands there, okay? And so um, when you uh, download this and open it up, uh, it will look like this and it will, um, uh, th you know, we reference um, problems from the, uh, the textbook and, um, and you guys should be able to download the, uh, the textbook right uh, here, okay? Um, and so you download it from, from the website. You should be able to get chapter three, and the exercises in chapter three are stuff like this, okay? So it says, you know, consider the function y equals f of x defined by this, negative x cubed, x squared, and the square root of x. And um, when you create the plot, it should look something like this, okay? Um, and you will, um, you'll have to write that as a, as a function here, okay? Um, so anyway, you'll um, enter your code there, you'll render it, and then there's, you know, just a few exercises from uh, the Spurs textbook to go through there, okay? And that's gonna be half of the uh, assignment. And then the other half, is the hard part, and that is writing a tic-tac-toe game that will run in R, okay? And so um, I used to, um, when I first created the assignment, I had like, you have to create these functions and do it this way. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna open it up and just let you choose to code it up the, uh, the way you wanna code it up. However, if you're not sure how to get started, I have some uh, recommendations listed uh, here on the tic-tac-toe recommendations script, okay? And so technically, uh, we have learned already everything that you need in order to get through homework two. Um, it's, it's all just um, flow control and conditionals, and, uh, and, that, and that's all you need to get through the second homework assignment, okay? For some of you who have strong coding and programming backgrounds, this will not be a difficult task. You'll just have to get used to the R syntax and you know indexes start at one and, and things like that. Uh, for others of you, this might be your first um, code project that is you know about a hundred lines of code or or so. Okay, and um, the key here is to break down the assignment into small manageable chunks, okay? And you wanna to try to, um, and so in, under recommendations, I've listed off, um, you know, like five functions that I think break down the task into chunks that are, are manageable and, um, and will allow you to, uh, to complete the thing, right? If you just start off and say, I need to write a tic-tac-toe game, that's gonna be overwhelming, okay? <laughs> and, and you might not be able to get started. But if you say, you know what, we're going to just um, display a tic-tac-toe board, okay? That's, that's not a tough task, okay? Displaying a tic-tac-toe board. Um, so, uh, you know, my recommendation is you have a variable in the um, global environment called state, and the state will keep track of the state of the game, okay? And so the game, the tic-tac-toe board, there's nine spaces for you to, to uh, uh, fill out, and, um, 
and so the state just can be a vector of length nine. I'm sorry, maybe, um, I, I guess I'm assuming that everybody knows how to play tic-tac-toe, but, um, but you know what, you type in tic-tac-toe and this is, it's this game, right? So you, you say, all right, I'm X, I'm gonna go here, O is gonna go there, I will go here, and O goes there, and, um, and now I have forced a win, haha, <laughs> I win. Okay, so, uh, so you know, that's, that's Google's thing. Ours will not be as beautiful. Um, yours, uh, I have at, at the in our uh, in your homework, I've recorded a, a video that uh, that I played for another class. Um, and you can watch watch this. This week you guys have homework and it's awkward hearing your own voice. Um, okay, and the uh, and the way the game is going to work is you uh, you call the function play. Oops, let's see. Okay, and then when it asks, it'll ask how many players should there be, you know, uh, one or two, and in this case we're going to say one, and then uh, should the computer play first or second, and then it will ask you, you know, and this is this is what the board looks like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then you kind of declare, uh, you know, where it's going to play, and then, um, and so we said play five, and so it puts an X in position five, and then the computer responds with O plays seven and puts an O into position seven. Okay, and you can you can watch this video to see um, the uh, you know my code running, um, and of course you don't have to write it the same same way I've done. Okay, but you know uh, let's say uh, so the way I I did it was um, state is going to be um, a vector of nine NAs. And then, um, and then, if you want to put in play x into the uh, fifth position, you would do something like this. And then, um, and then the way we want is uh, we want to see something that looks like this, right? Vertical bars, and then a bunch of dash 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 plus dash 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 plus dash dash dash, and then. Um, So this is what we want for our board to look like. And so your first, um, to kind of make it, okay, so this is what we want it to look like. And, and so this can be done using something like this, right? We can, we can cap the state and use separators equal um, vertical bar. And if I do that, you know, we get something that looks like this, which is not what we want. So we obviously need to do something a little bit different, right? So, you know, I could do, you know, if else is uh, in a state. Um, so if it is in a, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm making something up here. I'm, I'm doing this on the fly. Um, you know, maybe we'll put in a blank space. Otherwise, um, here actually, we should do this. For i in one through nine, we'll, um, I'm, I'm just, is in a state i, if it is in a, put out i, otherwise um, print whatever is in the state, right? So if I do this, then we can cat d, okay, whoops. Oh, we gotta do d sub i, okay, so we'll do that. And then, so now I have one, two, three, four, x, six, seven, eight, nine, and then now it's a matter of kind of printing it out in, in such a way um, you know, maybe you have to do it like this. You do D, D1, D2, D3, separators equal, OK, 
Okay. And then you'll cat dash 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 plus dash 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 plus dash dash dash. Four, five, six. Okay, let's just see what this looks like. Okay, so obviously, you know, um, and then, you know, if you include this all inside one function, it'll, you know, you get one, two, three, dash, 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 and then four, x, six, things, so on and so forth, right? Okay, so anyway, this is just um, something to get started. And so, you know, start off, break it down. And, you know, I've recommended creating a function that just takes the state vector, which has is a, a character vector of length 9 with NAs and values filled in, and then make it go from um, that character vector into something that looks like a tic-tac-toe board. Okay? And, then, um, and then I have uh, I suggested a function called prompt user, which asks the user where they want to play. You know? Uh, you know, which name the position that you want to play, and then you say something like three or position nine or whatever. And when you play tic-tac-toe, you want to guard against like cheating. And so if X has taken spot five, you don't want O to then say, hey, I want to go in spot five and just override that spot. So you've got to have a way to say, hey, this spot is taken. You've got to give me a different number, right? So if if X has played in the middle in spot five, and then you prompt the O user, where do they want to go? And they say, I want to play in spot five. You got to say, you're not allowed to play there. Okay. And so they say, okay, fine. I will play in spot two. And then you will allow them to play in spot two. Okay. And so, so that will just display and prompt the user. And then once you have prompt user, you need to update the state. So take whatever has been inserted, prompted by the user, and update the state so that it will um, uh, now include, you know, O in the correct position. All right. Um, I strongly recommend not using super assignment. Okay, especially for the update function. The update function students are tempted to use super assignment and modifying the state value in the global environment. Instead have the update function return the new state, but then you capture that. So you assign whatever update the update function returns, and you assign that to the state in the global environment. Okay. Um, and then um, there's a computer turn. This one's a, a little bit tricky. I would say leave that to the end. And then at the end, you'll check to see, check to see if there's a winner. So you need to check you know, if uh, all the rows across the top are filled in or, you know, something like that. And, uh, and play is kind of just a, a wrapping function that, that ties everything together. And I've given out kind of in pseudo code how play should work, okay? And it's just kind of a, a, a large loop. And the outer loop, it's a while loop. While there's no winner, then what you're going to do is you're going to display the board. You're going to ask x to play, and you update the state after x plays. And then you're going to check to see if x has won. And if, if x wins, then you quit the game. Okay. If x has not won, then you prompt o if, uh, to play. Okay. And then you update the board accordingly. And then you'll check to see if o has won. And if they win, then you quit the game. Otherwise, uh, you go back to the top. And, uh, and you run the uh, while loop again, okay? And you say, you ask for X to play. After anyone plays, you check to see if there's a winner, okay? And then if there's no winner, then you go on to the next. Then you ask O to play, check to see if there's a winner, okay? And you keep going back and forth until somebody wins or until there's no places to play anymore, right? So if, uh, if all nine positions are taken and there's no winner, then you also have to quit and say the game has ended in a tie. Yes, question. Do you have to make the computer like play like where it should go? You, you, just so the computer turn, I've, I've described this. You do not have to have the computer turn play perfectly. 
okay? Um, you don't need to have it think ahead or anything like that, but you do need to um, have it uh, win if it's able to win, and you do need to have it block if it's able to block, okay? So if there's, um, if the computer is O and there's two O's in you know, the top left corner and the top, then, and if position three up here is available, O needs to play in that position to win, okay? On the other hand, if there's X, X, and a blank, and there's no, if there's no way for O to win, O needs to play to block, okay? So you do need to Im implement basic win and basic block functionality, all right? And that's, a, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little tough, okay? I'll admit. And um, so anyway, I've tried to detail out some points. Um, you know, we'll see. Basically, get if you get a two-player game working, okay, you'll get 35 out of the 50 points, okay? So if you can get it to work just for two human players, as in like somebody puts in a thing and somebody else puts in a thing and it goes back and forth and that works correctly, flawlessly, you'll get 35 out of the 50 points. The remaining 15 points will come from if you have the computer play correctly, which includes uh, successfully takes a winning spot, successfully blocking the player, and correctly ending the game, okay? This correctly ending the game often gives uh, students some challenges, okay? Like, it needs to, as soon as there's a winner, it needs to stop, okay? You don't want to prompt for additional playing if there's already a winner, okay? Um, anyway, you should be able to get started on it tonight, and I, I do recommend doing that. Um, and we have that. Okay, are there any questions? Okay. Um, don't search the internet and look for somebody else playing, <coughs> writing their own tic-tac-toe thing, okay? This is something you need to think up and write up on your own, okay? It's, you, you will not learn, you will not become a better programmer by copying someone else's solutions, okay? There is a time and place for seeing how somebody does something and incorporating that into your own thing. But just copying and pasting in a solution entirely is not going to help you learn. Okay, you've got to try this out. And, and so, you know, my recommendations are, they're just recommendations. Okay, they used to be requirements, but then students complained that they didn't like the way I thought. So it's fine. If, if, if you want to uh, write your own tic-tac-toe game in, a, in another way, that, that's fine. Okay. Um, but, uh, but my recommendations are there just as a way to have broken down the problem into smaller chunks that I think are uh, each manageable. Okay, any, uh, any questions on that? Okay, and then obviously you would have to throw this into some kind of function, right? Display is going to be a function of state and... New line is slash n. Okay, so that that looks pretty good. Maybe we want to include a space in the beginning. Oh, I did something wrong. Oh. is annoying. I think I did it a little bit different, but ah, okay. All right. So anyway, you can see this is what we do. This is this is life, right? Okay. All right, this will this will do it. 
Yay, okay, so I've done <laughs> all of that just for just to get that first line going, right? But this this makes this works and, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> okay. Good? Questions? Alright, so we're ready for uh, today's content. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's get this uh, open in our browser. All right, so we got environments and object-oriented programming in R. And uh, and so first, talking about environments, you know, we we talked a little bit about scoping, but. Um, uh, so I think we had this on Thursday, but I, I just had a few more examples, added a few more examples for you to kind of explore here. Okay, so here we've got y, uh, y equals 1 in the global environment. Inside function g, we assign y is 2. And so when we call g of 3 on function, right, g is a function of x, so it's going to take 3, assign it to x, and it's going to return x plus y. It's going to do 3 plus the 2 that's inside the environment for g. Add those two together, and it returns back 5. OK. Uh, I think we had this thing on Thursday. Um, here, we've got x, y, and z. They're all 1 in the global environment. We create a value of 2 for y inside the scope of f. Inside the scope of f, we're creating function g. And inside the scope of g, we create um, a value z equal to 3. And so when we say return g, it's going to return x, y, and z. It's going to find the 3, it's going to find the 2, it's going to find the 1. Add those two together, it returns 6. And in the envir global environment, x, y, and z still have the values 1. Okay. Are, are these OK so far? What, what's happening? Why we've got x, y, and z. Again, these values y and z exist only inside the scope of the functions f and g, and so they don't interact with the ones in the global environment. Okay. Here again, we got x, y, z is one in the global environment. Y, it says assign the value of two to y in the higher up scope, which is going to be the global environment. Okay. Here, within function f, we've got function g, and we say assign the value of three to z in the scope higher up which is going to be f, but it doesn't find y, so it goes to the higher scope, going to g. So it takes 1, 2, and 3, adds them together, and returns 6. And in the global environment, we have modified them to the values 1, 2, and 3. OK, this is a little crazy. We've got x, y, z assigned to 1. 1 is assigned to x, y, and z in the global environment. Here we create a value 2 inside the current scope f. Then we say assign the value 4 to y in the higher scope. So this will modify the y in the higher scope, but there still exists a y that has the value 2 inside the scope of f. Okay, And inside here we've got g, it says assign the value 3 to z. It's going to look in the higher scope, it doesn't find a z it climbs up and it find, modifies the z up here in the global. So z is going to take on 3. And then we say return x, y, and z when we call return g. So what is this going to return? It's going to return 6 because x searches here. It doesn't find x. It doesn't find x. It goes to the global environment. x has a value 1. y, it searches for y. It's not in the g, but it comes here and it finds y is 2. So it does not look at the y, which has the value 4 in the global environment. Okay, And then z, it doesn't find anything until it gets to the global environment. So it's going to do 1 plus 2 and 3 and give us 6. But when we ask what are the values of one, uh, x, y, and z in the global environment, they have the values 1, 4, and 3. Okay, 
Is that all right? Yes. Does the double arrow go just to the immediate parent environment or straight to the global? Environment? It goes to the immediate parent environment. And it searches. And then, and if it finds it there, it'll change it in that immediate parent. But if it doesn't, it keeps climbing until it finds it. And if it doesn't find it, it goes to the, all the way to the global. It'll create it in the global environment. OK. So let's keep making our lives more complicated. OK. We got 111 assigned to x, y, and z in the global environment. We create a y is 2 in the environment for f. We create a z is 10 in the environment for f. We ask to assign 4 to y, and it goes to the higher scope, which is the global. And then we say assign 3 to z in the higher scope. Okay. This finds the z right here, and it's going to change this one to 3. So then when we ask find x, y, and z, it doesn't find x here, so it searches. It has to take the x in the global environment. We ask for y, it searches, and it finds the 2 right here in the environment f. And then we ask find z, and it searches, and it comes here, and it finds that this z, which used to be 10, has been changed to 3. So it's going to be 1, 2, and 3, and it returns 6. When we ask what is x, y, and z in the global environment, though, it is. I got a cough. I don't want to cough into the microphone. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Um, it's going to find uh, x in the global environment is 1. y in the global environment has been changed to 4 right here. But the z in the global environment has not been modified because this super assignment command for z has been, I don't know, stopped, captured by this z in the higher scope. Is that OK? If I threw this on a midterm exam, would you know that the answer is 141? With, with some studying, you will, right? So, OK. So, I mean, these are, these are weird examples that I'm throwing up here um, that I, I think illustrate what, what happens with super assignment, okay? I don't know why I said e super assignment, but um, avoid super assignment. That's my general recommendation, okay? Because this is confusing, right? This is, this is weird. We got to know what happens, but it's better not to use the weird thing, okay? So let's say you want to update some object foo, OK? Or in your tic-tac-toe, you want to update the state, OK? So this is bad, OK? We're going to say add, add the square to is going to be the, um, the function, add square, bad version, OK? It's going to take the object foo, and we're going to take x. And what we want to do is we just want to combine x squared to the currently existing foo. And so we're going to say, take foo and add, tack on x squared to it. Okay, and we're doing super assignment here. So we have foo is 2, and we say add the squared bad version, and we say do it to 5. And then we ask for what's foo, and foo is 2 and 25. Okay, that sounds, that seems reasonable. That seems reasonable. But, you know, what if you have something else? What if we have something called bar, okay? And we run the function add square bad to bar. We do bar and 5. And we ask, so bar is 10. And we expected um, 5 squared to appear, but bar is unaffected. Bar is 10. And we have, um, uh, we're expecting 25 here, OK? But uh, what happened is, foo, which used to be 225, now has the value 1025. OK? Why did that happen? Because when we, because of super assignment, OK? So this is the weird part, right? We did add square bad, OK? And we passed it the argument bar, which has a value of 10. And so we basically said add square bad 10 comma 5. And so what this is going to do is it looks at this and says, OK, you've got 10 and 5, what we're going to do is we're going to take 
foo, which is 10, and tack on 5 squared, 25, and we're going to store that in foo in the global environment. And so foo in the global environment takes on the value 10 and 25. Okay? This is probably not what we wanted it to do. Okay? So instead, write your function like this. And there's no notice there's no assignment here. This is just the last line. It's going to be what it returns. So here we're writing a function of baz. Okay? And we're going to say take baz, tack on x squared, and return that. Okay? And so we have foo is 2. We'll do add square foo 5, okay? And we're going to take the whatever this function returns, we're going to store it into foo. And so foo takes on 2 and 25. Here we have bar. Bar is 10. And we're going to run add square to bar and 5. And whatever this outputs, we're going to store into bar. And so bar gets updated to 10 and 25. Okay? So this is how I recommend you run your functions is that you don't do some kind of assignment operation in the function itself, but you say the function is going to return a value, and then if you want to change a variable, you say we're going to take the output of the function and assign that output to whatever variable it is. Okay, And so when you're updating your state, instead of having some kind of super assignment in there, which is tempting to do, Say instead have your state and then say state is going the output of your update function is going to be stored into state and you'll update the state that way. You'll say the output of the update function is then going to be stored into state and you have that as an explicit um, operation here. Okay. Does that make sense? Avoiding this super assignment stuff? Okay, now we can get into um, environments. Environments, what happened here? My figure is not appearing. No, oh, I have it in the wrong folder here. All right, let me try this again. Okay, there we go. Um, the environment is the data structure that powers scoping, okay? The job of an environment is to associate or bind names to values, okay? And so you can think of the way R views environments are as a bag of names. So here we've got the names A, B, C, and D. And in the environment, if we do something, okay, here we, we can say new environment. This is, effect, you know, like the global environment is a global environment. We, you know, if we assign the value false, to A, then what it's doing is it's taking the name A and it's binding it to the value false. We take the name B, the name B is bound to the character <coughs> A. And then the value C, the name C is bound to the value 2.3 and the name D is bound to the vector 1, 2, 3. Okay, so that's, that's what um, when we assign um, some value, some object to a name, this is what we are doing. We are saying this name is now referencing this uh, value in memory. Okay. Um, every environment has a parent. Okay, which is another environment. Which you know, when we were talking about you know the function f and the function g inside f, you know. The, the environment created in G has a parent environment, which is the environment created in F, and that environment has the parent environment, which is the global environment. Okay, So in diagrams, we here we'll have this little arrow going from uh, one environment to its parent. Okay, So the parent is used to uh, implement lexical scoping, and so if, uh, if R doesn't find the name in the current environment, then it will search the parent environment, okay, until it gets to the um, to the very end, uh, which is the global environment, not the global environment, which is the empty environment. The empty environment is the I don't know, 
the grand ancestor of all environments, okay? So uh, here are the, uh, the four important environments. We've got the global environment. This is your general workspace, okay? And the parent of the global environment is the last package that you have attached with the command library. So when you add more packages to R and you say, I want to use ggplot and I want to use dplyr and I want to use, I don't know, library mass or whatever, um, those become parent environments of the global environment, which sounds a little strange, but it makes sense because when you're in the global environment, when you're in your regular workspace, after you've loaded a package like ggplot, ggplot2, and then you call the command ggplot, what R first does is it says, do I have a function called ggplot in the global environment? And it's going to say, no, I don't. So I need to search the parent environment, which is going to be the last package that you lo loaded, maybe that's ggplot2, and inside there it finds the function ggplot. Okay. So when you... Um, when you do that, it's gonna it's gonna do that. Okay. Um, this uh, goes all the way up to base environment. So the base environment is the base package. This has kind of your base R functions, things kind of like make a factor or something like that, right? Um, and then the empty environment. This is the ultimate ancestor of all environments. It's the only environment without a parent. Okay. And then environment is your current environment. So um, you can ask uh, for the search path, which is which is going to list all the environments. You can type this into R. And when you say search, it's going to start off with global environment. And in my case, its parent is package stats, then package graphics, package, is this graphic devices? I don't know, utilities, data sets, methods, autoloads all the way up to the base package, which kind of has your most uh, basic functions there. Okay, and so this is kind of what the uh, picture looks like. Here's your global environment. You got all of these libraries and, and stuff, and if you load up some library, like li package, you know, library ggplot2 or something, it's gonna insert it in between global environment and or just directly above global environment in, in the order. And so that, that will be inserted right here. And so the search path will go through all of those packages until it reaches the empty environment. OK. Yes, question. Um, so if you're looking for a name of an object, and they have the same, and look at these packages you download, they yeah. have the same name yeah. that objects. Go the latest downloaded one first the, the, yeah the latest loaded one yeah so if you, if if you, there's one library and it's got a function called um, they usually try you know most of these packages try to avoid using the same thing but let's say there's a, a function called um, I don't know difference diff okay and and so um, so actually I think, Okay, so if I ask what is diff, it'll say uh, lagged differences. I think this is the package I want. All right, this is the function I'm talking about. So there's a function called diff in base. All right, that's what that's what this thing. So this the curly brace means in the base and package there's a function called diff. All right. Now if I call library dplyr, um, oh I guess. Um, oh, I guess it was set diff. Okay, so here, um, here let me uh, just restart my R. So it was set diff. That was that was the one I wanted. Okay. Okay. So if I say what is set diff? Okay, here it will talk reference set diff in the base package. Okay, but when I load up library dplyr. There is a function called set diff, okay, and it says the following objects are masked. So you get these message: the following objects are masked from package masked from package base, which means when you call for set diff now, 
um, it uh, it recognizes that there's two set diffs. There's set operations and deplier, and so we've got set diff from package deplier, which operates this way, and we have we still have the set diff um, function in base operations. Okay, and so the set diff here is going to um, this is to find the difference between two sets. Okay, the set diff here is going to use the one in the uh, most recently loaded library. Okay, deplier. If you want to um, use the one in base, okay, so set diff. Let's see. Okay, so you can see that when I type in set diff, R Studio is saying this is the one from deplier. Okay, it's like a little, it's hard to see on the screen, but it's saying this is set diff from deplier. Okay, now if we want to use the set diff from base, we can do that and we can type in base colon colon set diff. Okay, and you can see here it highlights and it says this is going to be set diff from base. Oops, that was the wrong the wrong thing. But so so we, we can still access this, but we have to specifically say from this package, colon colon, use this function. Okay? But otherwise when we call set diff, it's now going to assume I'm talking about the set diff in library deplier because that was the kind of the last library that I loaded. And yeah, and if I loaded some other function out there. That, uh, or library that loads it up, then it will use that. And, and if I decided to create in my own global environment, this is stupid, but if I say I'm going to create my own function called set diff and say, uh, you know, print um, my uh, set diff function, okay, then when I call set diff, it's going to run my set diff function, which is, is totally useless, right? But because that's that's how R works. It's going to search the global environment. If it finds it, it's going to say, all right, let's use that, OK? Uh, and if it doesn't, then it searches the, uh, the search path. It searches all these things. Are there questions on this? Yes? Uh, so if we want to use a specific set a function, we should import the package. Yes, yes. So if you need it, if you, right. Um, if I didn't, like if I just tried to, so before, like if I call for ggplot, okay, it's going to say I couldn't find function ggplot, okay? So I have to load the library, ggplot2, okay? And now I can call ggplot, and it will create a blank plot, okay? Because now I have inserted the library ggplot into my search path so that when I say I want to use the function ggplot, it will say, oh, I have found it in this library. Okay. Otherwise, it, it won't know. Okay, we've talked about this, but it's, it's important to, uh, to bring it up. Okay, so, um, so a lot of environments are created as a consequence of using functions, all right? And there are four environments associated with a function. The enclosing environment, the binding environment, the execution environment, and the calling environment, okay? Probably the most important one to remember are the uh, enclosing environments and the execution environment, okay? Those are probably the, uh, the most important two, okay? Um, all right, so every function has one and only one enclosing environment. That's going to be the environment where the function was created. And then the three other types of environment, and there might be zero or one or many uh, with each of these. Okay, so uh, binding a function to a name creates a binding environment. That's where the, uh, the name of the function exists, which sounds like that should be the enclosing environment. And if you create a function in the global environment, the binding environment and the enclosing environment are the same. There's a technical difference between um, the enclosing environment and the binding environment when it's functions that are loaded in the library. Don't worry about it, okay? The execution environment is the temporary 
or I wrote ephemeral environment that stores variables during the execution of the environment. So when you run a function, it creates a temporary little sandbox for all of its variables. It runs all of the stuff, and when the function finishes, that execution environment disappears. It's gone. Everything that was there inside that execution environment that was not saved is gone. Okay. And then every execution environment is associated with a calling environment, which is uh, the environment that was that you were in when you called the function. Okay. But I would say the execution environment and the enclosing environment, these are the most important ones. Okay, so when a function is created, it gains reference to the environment where it was made. The enclosing environment is used for lexical scoping. So when you and when you name a function, the environment where the name exists is the binding environment. In most scenarios, these are the same. Okay. And so here, uh, in the global environment, I've got the value one associated with the name y. That's what we have here. And then we've got a function, f, a function associated with the name f. Okay. And we can ask what's the environment? And it'll say the global environment. The uh, the function was created inside the global environment, so it's its enclosing environment, and the name f exists in the global environment, so global environment is also the binding environment. Um, yeah, let's skip this. This is not 99% of the time you don't have to worry about it, so <laughs> we'll, we'll just leave that. Okay, if you're interested, you can read the documentation on this stuff. Okay. Here's the execution environment. We'll, we'll talk about this. So here we're creating a function called h, okay? And inside function h, we're taking the number 2 and assigning it to the name a, and then we return the value x plus a, okay? And so we're going to, in the global environment, we're going to call function h and pass it the value 1 into its argument x. And we're going to take its output and store it to y. All right? So what, what is y going to take on the, what value will y have at the end of all of this? This should be easy. Huh? <laughs> are, are we just not able to see the screen? Is that what's going on? Okay, so we've got function h. Inside eight, it's a, it's a function of x. Inside function h, we're going to take the value 2 and assign it to a, and then we're going to return the value x plus a, and we're calling the function h on the value 1. So what's this going to return? 3. Y will take on the value 3. Okay, that was not hard, right? Okay, this is the diagram illustration of what's going on, okay? Inside the global environment, we have... Oh, I'm sorry. When we call a function um, h with one, okay, it's creating an execution environment, this little dotted line indicating this is a temporary thing, okay? Inside this, we've associated the one value one with the name x via the argument, right? So x has the value one. And then we're right here, next line, take the value two and assign it to the name a. So we've got x is one, a is two, and then the function completes by returning the value 3. It's done. Okay, it combines a and x. This is 3. And it's going to store the output of that to the name y. And so in the global environment, we still have the function h. And y is now associated with 3. And, and these values, a and x, that were 1 and 2, they are gone. There's, they don't exist. Calling environment, it's not a huge deal, okay? Technically, this execution environment, it's got, technically it has two parents. One is the enclosing environment, um, which is where H exists. And if there is some slightly unusual scenario where you are calling a function inside the other function, inside another function, then, um, then the calling environment is technically the function that um, 
is the environment that was used to call the other function. Okay. And generally, uh, the scoping rules. So when you call a function and it's looking for it's looking for names and stuff, it's going to use the enclosing environment to search for the names. But um, but R does support something called dynamic scoping. We're not going to get into that, but that, that uses the values in the calling environment instead. Okay, but don't don't worry about that. Okay, is that is this okay? Uh, I, I would say the most important thing again is this execution environment, and then the kind of the enclosing environment, which explains kind of like when it doesn't find a value and it searches higher up, it's going to search the enclosing environments. Okay, unless you're using dynamic scoping, which is something we're not covering in this class. Yes? What is the relationship between these four um, environment function variants? Like, um, who is whose parents? Who is whose parent? Um, so, so this execution environment, OK, so if, in this case, we called H inside the global environment, OK? And H exists, was created and named in the global environment, OK? So in this case, H's enclosing environment is the global environment. So it means if it doesn't find a value inside the scope, it's going to search its parent, which is the enclosing environment, the global environment, OK? Because the name H exists in the global environment, the global environment's also the binding environment, OK? And then uh, because we called H, inside the, uh, we called H inside the global environment. Um, the global environment's also the calling environment, okay? So, so, and this is gonna be your typical scenario when you're writing your own functions is that you generally write your function inside the global environment and you're calling it inside the global environment. So all of these things are the global environment, okay? Things change up when you are writing packages and or calling functions inside other functions and you're using dynamic scoping okay but so inside a package because the name exists in the package namespace and not in the global environment um, and the the function itself was created in uh, some other place, you know, the enclosing environment and the binding environments are technically not exactly the same. And so um, things, things vary a little bit, okay? If you're not planning on writing packages and stuff, this is probably stuff you don't need to worry about, okay? At some point when you're like ready to write packages, you've got a thousand hours of R coding under your belt and you feel good about writing production level stuff, then you can start worrying about these things. Right now, you're going to be writing functions inside the global environment. You're going to be calling them from the global environment. So global environment will be kind of the parent namespace for all of these things. Okay. And, and you're probably not using dynamic scoping yet. Okay. But again, the, the key thing here is that this execution environment, whatever is created in there, it disappears when, when the function stops running. Okay, now, um, so that was the first hour of the class. And then in our second hour, again, this is, it's summer session, right? So normally these would be split over a couple lectures, but because it's summer session, everything's like boom, 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 boom. Now we're moving right along to object-oriented programming, okay? So um, maybe before I get into this, I'll just, I'll give you a few seconds to think about anything that was confusing. Ask any questions about the scoping and the environment. Yes? Does every execution environment comes with a calling environment? Yes, every execution environment has an, uh, an enclosing environment and a calling environment. The, um, the, Generally, when you when inside the execution environment, if it can't find the name of something it's looking for, it's going to search the enclosing environment, which is where the function exists. Okay. If you are using dynamic scoping, which we're not covering in this class, you can say don't search 
the environment that where this package where this function exists, which is the enclosing environment, but search instead the environment from which this function was called. So it's like if you're inside, so let's say you've written function h inside the global environment, and um, and you're searching for some value y, which doesn't exist inside the function. The uh, when you call y, it will generally search the global environment, which is where the function exists, which is its enclosing environment. But if you um, use dynamic scoping and you're calling function h within another function and there's uh, something there, it will, um, it will search its parent scope. So here, let, uh, and I forget how to implement dynamic scoping off the top of my head here. Okay, but so, so right here, g is created inside f. Okay, so G's enclosing environment is F, and F's enclosing environment is the global environment. So when we call G here, and it's searching for Y, it searches its parent environment and enclosing environment, which is F. And that's why it does this. But let's see. If I come along here, I, you know, this is always risky doing something live because I'm going to say it does this thing and then it does the opposite thing. Okay, let's say um, so here. This is this is the uh, thing it uses that, and then if we ask for what is um, x, y, and z in the uh, environment, this is what we have, right? Okay. Let's say here x, y, and z have the value 1 in the global environment. Okay, I've created function f and I've created function g. g now exists. Here, wait, let me delete everything out of here. Okay, x, y, and z are in the global environment. F exists and G exists. G is now created in the global environment. So this is the, its parent environment is the global environment. Okay? So what will happen when I call F? Okay? When I call F, it's going to say Y is 2 and return G. Okay? Here, let's, um, let's just do uh, cat X. Y, Z, okay? So when I call F here, it goes to, it's going to say F is this, Y is 2, and return G. So when we call G here, it's going to say, uh, it's going to execute G in the global environment, and it's going to assign 3 to Z, and it's going to cat X, it doesn't find X here, so where does it go? It goes directly to the global environment and uses 1. And it, when it calls for Y, it, its parent environment, its enclosing environment here, is the global environment, so it uses the 1 here. It's not using the, uh, the Y that's inside F. Okay? And then when it calls for Z, then it uses the 3 that's right here. Okay. This is different from what we had before, which is where G is created inside of F, right? So G is created inside of F, and so when I call um, F here, when it can't find the Y, it searches its parent environment, the enclosing environment where G is created, and uses the value 2. Is that okay, the distinction of what's going on? The difference between the enclosing environment and the calling environment? Okay. And I forget how to use dynamic scoping on the fly. But if we wanted, in this scenario, 
I don't know why my voice keeps getting su super loud every now and then. If in this scenario, when we called G here and we wanted it to use this too, we would have to implement dynamic scoping and, uh, and we could do that. Um, but I forget how to do that off the top of my head. It's, it's not something that's common. Okay. Generally, you, you were, I mean, I don't want to say it's not common, but in general, you assume that it's using the enclosing environment when, for the, the scoping rules, okay, where the packet, where the function is created. Okay, questions? I don't know if this example just made everything worse. Okay, are you ready for object-oriented stuff? My cough is killing me. <coughs> <coughs> okay, um, <clears throat> I just copied and pasted this out of Hadley Wickham's textbook right here, this, this part. Um, there's three systems of object-oriented stuff in R. There's S3, which is the regular object-oriented stuff, and then there's S4, and then there's reference class, RC. Um, I would say S3 is the most important one that you have to learn, okay? We have to be familiar with this, and this, here's a wall of text, but, but I'll try to explain how S3 object-oriented systems work. Um, and then um, we're not going to cover S4, object-oriented stuff in our class, okay? It's, S4 is similar to S3, but it's more formal. S3 is very loose and informal, and you can create objects on the fly, or new classes of objects on the fly. S4 is a lot more formal, and you formally define new classes of object. And then, uh, and then lastly, we have reference classes, which implements uh, message passing object-oriented systems, which if you have done programming in other languages like Python or C++ or something, this is going to be the object-oriented system that, is, that feels most familiar to you, okay? Whereas um, uh, in R, S3 is your most common object-oriented system, okay? Um, The idea, before I get into this, the idea behind object-oriented syst uh, programming systems is that you ha have um, classes of an object and associated with classes, or not, okay, I shouldn't say, there's classes of objects and then there's methods, okay? And methods are, um, like actions that are specific for the class, okay? So in other object-oriented systems, you'd have some object, like, I don't know, a table, and it would have different methods that are associated with table, things like add, add a row or something like that, right? And this would be kind of like you have an object called car, and the car has methods that you can do with the car, like start engine, or uh, turn right, or turn left, or go reverse, okay? And you have these verbs that are associated with the car. Those are other object-oriented systems. In um, R, we have something called um, generic function object-oriented stuff, okay? And so here, rather than saying here's an object and these are the actions or methods that are associated with the object, we have generic verbs. And the verbs take on different forms, the different functions. We have generic functions, generic verbs, and they take different forms based on the object you give it. Okay? So in this case, it's something like 
Um, think of the verb swing, swing, okay? And if I give you a baseball bat and I say swing, show me what swing looks like, what would you do? You would take the baseball bat and you would swing like this, right? However, if I give you the same verb and I say what I want you to do is swing and the, next, and the object I give you is a golf club, you're not going to do this. You're going to change your action and you're going to look down and swing like this, right? And then if I give you something like a book and I say swing, you'll be a little bit confused, but then you'll take the book and you'll say, well, the best thing I can think of is like, I don't, I don't know, right? You, you change the action, what you're doing, based on the object that's given to you. So you have a generic verb called swing, and that verb swing behaves differently based on the kind of object you give it. And that's what object-oriented systems in R, that's how they work. We have generic verbs like print, okay? And based on what we give R and the print command, it's going to do things differently, right? Well, if we give it an atomic vector, the way it prints it out is you know, square bracket one and the contents of the vector. If we give it an, a matrix, you know, and we ask print, the way it prints out is not with square bracket one, but it's like, first you have the rows across the top, which is square bracket comma one, square bracket comma two, et cetera, et cetera, and then you have the contents in each row and things like that. And, you know, depending on the object that you give it, the way um, that verb print, how that verb print or function print behaves is different, okay? I guess technically atomic vectors and matrices are base type things, but, uh, but they underlie the object-oriented system. Okay. Um, you can install this package prior, it's not... The only time I use this package prior is for this lecture. <laughs> I don't really use it ever again. Okay. Um, so underlying every R object is a C structure that des describes how the object is stored in memory, and then you get kind of your base types and stuff like that, right? Um, and unfortunately, the names are weird, and the type of for functions is closure and, and all of this. Okay. Let's just go straight to S3, okay? Um, if we create something called a data frame, if we create a data frame, this is technically an S3 object. It is of class data frame. Because if we ask what is the type of on a data frame, how is the data frame stored in memory? A data frame is stored as a list, right? Data frames are stored as lists. But when we print out a data frame, it doesn't show up as a list with the double square bracket and the dollar signs and this and that. It shows up like a rectangle, right? So if we, if I came along to, and if I just type in MT cars, which is a um, built-in data set, okay? Motor trend cars, okay? It, it prints out like this, right? But if I say type of, okay? The type is a list, but we ask what is its class, and it's a data frame, okay? And, and so when we say print empty cars, it doesn't print like a list, right? Because if I did a print.list, uh, not list. Okay. If we printed it as a list, it would look like something like this, with the dollar signs and each thing. This is how lists are generally printed out in R, but then you know, when we print, print out the, uh, the data frame in R, it looks like this. So, so how does R know to do this? Well, it sees this attribute, class, data frame, and it says, oh, because this is a data frame, I have to do this print method differently, right? Because this is a baseball bat, when, I, when I'm when i told to swing, I'm going to swing it a certain way, 
because this is a golf club and I'm told to swing, I'm going to swing it a different way. Okay? And this is what R is seeing. It's seeing because this is a data frame, when I'm told to print out the object, I'm not going to print it out the way a list looks. I'm going to print it out the way a data frame is supposed to look. Okay? And that allows us to um, use the function print without having to learn because technically inside the R language there's like a hundred different print commands. There's print commands for data frames, print commands for linear model objects, print commands for summaries, print commands for this and that, and technically we would have to reference each of these different things and we would have to memorize all of these different function names. But to make our lives easier we can just say print and this the um, the computer knows to use the print method that's specific for data frames. Okay. Right. So, oh, you know, and so if if I had given you um, a cricket bat and I said swing, and you've never seen cricket before, you might not be sure what to do. Right. Um, and, and, and so it, it's kind of similar in that if, um, if you're given something and, and you don't know, have a method specific to it, it's going to probably just do a, a default swinging action. And, and similar to R, if you give it a, a class that it's not sure what to do with, it's going to just kind of do uh, its default thing until you define something specific for that class. Okay, and so um, anyway, we can um, see that a method, a function is a generic function because when we ask for its definition, we are going to see this command that says use method. Okay, and so the function mean is a generic function, and and, and R is able to do <coughs> uh, run the function mean for numeric vectors, but it's also able to do it for like date time objects and other things of different classes. Um, and it is a generic function because it will say use method mean. Okay. So if I just if you type in mean without the parentheses, it will it will show you kind of the the underlying code. So if you do print without any parentheses, this is also a generic function that says use method. Okay. Whereas factor, which is not a generic function, okay, there's no use method. This is the uh, code that R runs when it's creating a factor. Okay, so you can actually look at the code of any underlying function um, by. Uh, by just typing it in, typing the name of the function without any parentheses here. Okay, so mean and print, these are generic functions because inside there, there's something called use method, whereas something like factor is not a generic function, but is, is a way for us to create factors. Okay. Um, Okay, some of these, some generics don't use use method, such as sum. If we ask for sum, it, uh, it uses a primitive function, okay, which is, which means that uh, in order to add up the numbers quickly and get optimal computing speed, it uses C, so we don't get to see the underlying code there, okay? Um, and the way uh, we get specific versions of print is um, you get uh, the name of the function dot the class of the object okay so so here let me create a factor I'm going to delete everything out okay and so let's say I've got X is um, factor and we're going to give it characters a a, B, B, A. Okay? So here's 
factor, A, A, B, B, A. Okay. And if I ask what is the class of x, it will say factor. And if I ask what is the type of x, it will say integer, right? This is your homework, right? And so if I say print x, it will look like this, right? If I did print.default x, it will print out the underlying integer values, OK? But how does it know to print it like this? It's, it's really running print.factor x, OK? So there is, if I type in print dot, you can see there are a whole bunch of different print functions that exist, OK? There's print dot as is, print dot by, print dot date, print dot default, print dot factor, print dot function. There's all sorts of stuff for um, how it should do, OK? So if I did uh, print dot data frame on x, it, it doesn't know what to do, and it just prints out null, OK? So you can call the wrong thing, and it will, R will just try to do what it can, OK? But this is not quite right. OK? So, um, so we have, uh, you know, the print method specific for class factor is called print.factor, OK? The print method specific for data frames is called print.data.frame, OK? Or the print method that's specific for date objects is print.date. That's how we name things, and that's how R looks up um, um, its names, OK? So uh, when you create classes of objects, in general, we say don't use dot in the name, but use underscore. Because um, t.test, so this is, this is an old, old function. This would not be recommended today. But this is, runs a you know, student's t-test on a set of data. But what it looks like is it looks like it is the function t, which is generally transpose, applied to objects of class test. It looks like that, OK? We know it's not. It's for running students' t-test. Okay? But when you write something like this, it looks like uh, function t uh, applied to the class test. Okay? So in general, we don't recommend putting dots in um, object names and things like that. All right. So far, so good? OK. Um, so yeah, uh, t.dataframe is transpose for data frames. t.test is uh, the, the generic function for students' t-test. Okay. You can look up all of the methods for um, a function. You can say methods mean, okay? so, or we could do like methods print. Okay. And we see there's 233 different print functions. Okay. For you know, there's print for ANOVA objects, print for AOV objects, print for all of these things, print out default, but print for factors and all of that stuff. Um, so lots of different methods. Okay, it's all like just different versions of that verb print. Okay, and you can also see um, uh, all the methods associated with a certain class. OK, so class here, uh, we're asking, what are all the methods associated with class TS? Class TS is a time series object. And these are all the kind of the, the methods that are associated there. We can ask for methods with class equals factor. OK, and we have um, sp specific versions of print and plot and format and stuff like that for class factor, OK? And if there's not a specific method for this, then it will um, just use the default generic method out there, OK? So it's like, uh, you know, there's not a specific method for 
swing when it comes to book. So you're going to use your generic swinging action if somebody hands you a book. Um, so in S3, we can just uh, create classes and objects using um, this thing called structure. So here we're creating, taking an empty list and going to call it class foo, okay? And we do that with structure. Or you can just take an object, here foo is an empty list, and then you, after the fact, say the class of foo is now foo. Okay, and that's it. We've now successfully created a new class of object in R. Okay, S3 is very informal. We don't have to define anything. We can just say, boom, here's an empty list, and boom, it is now class foo, and R recognizes, okay, I've got something called class foo in my, uh, in my repertoire now. Okay. And then we can ask later on, what is the class of this object? And it says it's class of foo, OK? <clears throat> um, you know, classes can ha inherit properties from other things. So you can have like class foo, and then you can have like a subclass of like special foo, and it will inherit all of the properties from its parent class, OK? and um, and you can do this. So does foo inherit from itself foo? Yes, that's true. Um, and you can also ask, does it inherit from anything higher up? And it will tell you that it does or does not. OK, so the class of an object can be a vector, which describes behavior from the most specific to least specific. OK, so for example, there you, there's a function called GLM which creates generalized linear models. And generalized linear models um, are, have its own class and they inherit um, behaviors from the linear models class. So if you run GLM and you store the output of the GLM function, that output will be of class GLM LM, which means when you ask R, to apply a function like print, print the results of GLM, it's going to use the print method specific for GLM if it exists. Um, if there's not a method specific for GLM, it will then look for method specific to LM, if, and it will use that if it can find it. Okay, And if not, then it will use the default method. Right. So you can take, um, maybe you could say, uh, I've got baseball bat and use swing and maybe we have a method specific for baseball bats and we would run that okay but then um, maybe you have uh, I give you a broomstick and I say swing this okay maybe we don't have a method specific for broomstick but maybe we have um, a swing in our mind what we should do to swing with any generic stick type object, right? So if I give you a tree branch, a broomstick, I don't know, some other kind of stick, and I say swing, then, then your actions will look the same. So it's kind of like that. You've got something specific for a, a specific type of object, and if not, um, it can search for something less specific, and if there's nothing for that, then it will just use the default method that exists there. Okay. Um, you can create a function <clears throat> to create objects of that class. So, so we call these constructor functions. So for example, when we create a factor, an object of class factor, we do this by calling the function factor and applying it to some kind of vector, right? So we, you know, the way I created this factor, I don't know where it went, but a while back I created a factor by, by running this command, right? So there's a function called factor, and this is technically the constructor, which 
um, takes the input, assuming x is a character vector, and um, and then what it returns is f. And basically, uh, the class of f, we can see, um, you know, we create f, and it does all of this stuff. And the class of f is modified to be uh, ordered, if it's ordered, or factor, and things like that. And it returns the object f. It does all of this stuff in between. Um, you know, that's probably more complex. But basically, uh, you know, this is not required, but... Um, a lot of times this the way we create new things will be this way it, it doesn't have to be you can again just on the fly create an object and then just assign some string to the class and it will suddenly be be objects of that class okay so um, there's no checks for correctness okay so for example here we're creating a linear model between um, the log of miles per gallon with the log of displacement. Okay, and we're saying is there some kind of relationship using the Motor Trend Cars database or data frame? And so the model that we create has a class LM, and when we print the model, it prints it out like this. This is this is what we get. Um, but if we wanted to, we could say, you know what? I want to change the class of this object to class data frame. Okay, it's a bad idea, but if we uh, if we then say okay, print out what my model looks like, it looks like this. It says zero rows or zero length row names or something. It doesn't know what to do. Okay, the information is still there. The coefficients are still there, but all of this stuff that used to be here is weird because. R thinks that model is a data frame object, and so it's trying to print the results as if it were a data frame, but it it that it's not a data frame, so it can't print it out. Okay, so you can just change it back to class LM, and it will it will work. Okay, S three is very loose; doesn't uh, doesn't check for correctness. It just says, "I'll do my best." And then you get something like this, and it just says, this was the best I could do, OK? And maybe it's not what you wanted. This is a bad idea. It's not a good idea to just take an object of one class and just change its class on the fly. But, but you could, OK? So it would, it would be as if you blindfolded somebody, OK? And you hand them a baseball bat, and you say, um, what I gave you is a golf club. Now swing it, okay? They're gonna do the wrong thing, okay? They're gonna look kind of silly, but they're just taking the information you gave it gave to them, right? And you'll say, oh, you were given bad information, okay? Um, and on the other hand, <clears throat> you can also forcefully call the wrong um, the wrong method. On it, so you could give somebody a baseball bat. They know it's a baseball bat, but then you say, "I want you to swing this as if it were a golf club," and then they would do it, and they would look silly. And R can do the same thing. You can say, "I want you to use print dot default on x, which is a factor." Okay, so normally print x is calling print dot factor on x, and you know that's why you get the same result. But you can say, I want you to run print.default on x, or I want you to run print.dataframe on x, okay? And it'll do its best. It'll say, all right, I'll do what you're asking me to do, okay? But it's not going to look the way we generally want it to look, because you can, you can force R to just run the wrong method. You can force somebody to swing the, the object in a funny way, okay? If you want to create your own new methods, you can, OK? Here we can create a new met generic called f. f is going to be a function of x. And the way we define it to be a generic is we say use method f. And this suddenly tells r f is a generic function, and that when we call f, we want to try to find the version of f that is specific for this 
object class. Okay. So f, remember f is just use method f. And what R, this tells R is that when I call function f, we're going to have different versions of f. We've got f.a. We might have f.b for objects of class b. We've got f.house for objects of class house or something like that. Okay? And so here, f.a is a <coughs> specific version of f. And this function, all it does is it prints out class A onto the screen. So here, A is going to be an object of class A. It's an empty list object of class A. So we can say, what's the class of A? And then when we call F on object A, notice we are calling F, not F.A, but we're calling F. R says, oh, you have called generic function f, which says use method. So it says, OK, I'm going to look up the generic function of f. What is the class of this object? The class of this object is class a. Do I have a version of this function specific for class a? Yes, I do. It's called f.a. OK, let's run that function. It prints out class a. And so that's what it does here. Okay. So instead of having to remember that I've got a specific version of f for class A and a specific version of f for some other class that we haven't yet defined, we call the generic function f, and R will do the work of saying, ah, this is a generic function. I have to look up the version of f that is specific for this class type. And that's what it does. Okay. Here, um, we can take an existing method. So mean, .a, mean is already a generic function. And we could say um, mean.a, this is going to be a version of the mean function specific for class A. And we say, all right, all you're going to do is print out the letter A. OK, so when we call mean an object A, which is just an empty list, but of class A, it runs the version of mean specific for that, OK? Because normally, if we run mean on an empty list, right? so if I say L is an empty list, and I say mean of L, it's going to say NA. It's going to say, I don't, I don't know what you're doing, right? But I can say um, the class of L is going to be uh, class, what was it? Class A, right? So what is the class of L? Class of L is this. If I write, what is the mean of L? It does the same thing, because we don't have a specific version of the mean function for class A yet. But now I just say mean.a, this is of class A, and this is the mean of class A. OK? So this is, whoops, I need this, sorry. It needs to be a function. Okay, so mean a is a is a specific version. Okay, so I can say what's the mean of l now, and it returns this. Okay, l is still an empty list of class a, right? And if I take the class of l, and I say it's now class b, okay, l looks like this. And if I say what's the mean of l? It's going to say NA, right? So when I <clears throat> when L was of class A, it knew to call this version of the function mean. Is this okay? Are there questions on this? So we're creating versions or methods of a generic function that are specific for certain object classes. OK. Uh, method dispatch, uh, these are technical stuff. It looks at use, use method, and it looks up the uh, names, and it tries to look, look for each one. OK. So here's. Um, 
So here we're creating a generic function f. f.a is a method specific for class a, and f.default is the method that it runs by default if it can't find something for that specific version. Okay, so here we, we've got an object, empty list of class A. When we run F on it, it returns class A. Right? Here we're creating an object. The class is the vector B and A. Okay, we don't have a method specific for class B, so it climbs to the next thing in the class and, and it runs F of A, and it runs that and it says class A. Over here, we've got an object, empty list of class C, and, uh, and it doesn't find a method specific for class C, so it runs the default function, and it will print back unknown class. Um, We'll skip this slide. Um, again, methods are normal R functions. You can call them directly. Okay, so here this is, um, you know, object of class C. You can say f dot default, and it will return unknown class. But you can also force it and say call the method specific for objects of class A, even though it's an object of class C and it will do it, right? So this is just like telling somebody, here's a baseball bat, but I want you to swing it like a golf club, and, and they do it, okay? So you're, you're telling it to, um, so it's, it's like changing the class of the object, um, but it, it's just not a good idea, okay? Here's some uh, more S3 examples. Oh, I kind of got cut off here. Okay, well, um, let me get, get cut off here. All right, so here, um, let's, we'll delete everything out, okay? F is gonna be a generic function, F, and I've got F dot J and F dot K, all right? K takes on the value 2, okay? What will F of K return? So actually, um, oh, I, you know, I should do... Um, Should do this okay so when when you do this the first thing it will do let me uh, fix this up okay is that when you call f of k it's going to return an error because we have a generic function f a version of f specific for class j and a version of f a method of f specific for class k okay k is just a name Okay, k equal to 2 doesn't mean it's class k, it's just the name k uh, is associated with the value 2. So when I call f on this value 2, it's going to say, um, I don't have a method, I don't have a version of this function that I can apply to the number 2. I only have a version of the function that works for objects of class j and a version of this function for objects of class k. Okay? So, so it's going to say, I don't have something. Okay? So here, I can then say, okay, well, you know what? Class k, the class of object k is j. Object k has a class of j. So what will f of k return now? So object k 
has the value 2, and it's of class J. So when I say f of k, it will return, it will return 5, OK? Because um, it's going to say, what is this? k has the value 2 of class J, so it's going to run the function f dot j, and it's going to do 2 plus 3 and return 5. Is that OK? All right, let's go on. So now I'm going to create an object, or create a method called f.default. So this is what it's going to run if it can't find um, a method specific to a thing. OK? And here I've got f.l. OK, this is a method specific for objects of class L. And this is going to be uh, take the number and do x plus 5. <clears throat> so L is going to be um, the value 10 with the class K and L. Is that OK? So what will F of 11, F, it's not 11, F of L return? So L is the value 10. And it's of class K and L. So this will return what? It will return 14, right? So L is 10, but it's going to use the method for class K. It does x plus 4. Okay? If this didn't exist, if this did not exist, so like if I run all of this, and uh, and then I run this, so there's no f dot k, then running f of l will run will run the uh, method for this, right? Because it looks for k, it doesn't see it, and so it looks for l, it finds that, and it runs x plus five is fifteen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we can forcefully run f dot j on object uh, on the number seven, and what will this return? It will return ten, okay, because it does seven plus three. But then if I run f on the number seven, what will this return? 107, because it's going to use f.default. Yes, question? How does L have, um, how does L have two classes? Uh, this was just an example. L, uh, an object can have multiple classes. It can be a string of classes. And it's going to start, uh, and the way the methods work is it's going to start with the first class, and it's going to see if it can find a method for that first class listed. If it does, it uses it. If it doesn't, it moves on to the next one and searches for a method specific for that one. Yeah? Sort of lost I sort of answered your question. OK, well, good, good. OK. Um, yeah. All right. We've got reference classes. You will not be tested on this. I want to include the notes here, OK? And, and you can look over it. Um, if you're coming from Python, or if you know Python, or if you know C++ or something, it uses message passing object-oriented system, which says, here is the class of object, and these are the methods associated with this object class. Like, here's a table, and with the table, you can transpose it. Rather than saying, here's a transpose function, and it works this way for tables, and it works this way for data frames, and it works this way for matrix. Okay, with uh, over here, you have the baseball bat, and the baseball bat has different verbs associated with it. The verbs associated with baseball bat are swing, flip, smash. I don't know. Okay, um, so so that that exists, and it's it's been implemented in R, and um, and the notes for that are here. Okay, this uh, there is. The use of superassignment here, and this is like one of the legit uses of superassignment 
for um, in, in R. Okay, you won't be tested on it, but uh, but I do want to include the notes here for you for your reference. Okay, uh, that will wrap it up for today on uh, object oriented stuff, and uh, and with that, we'll see you guys on Thursday. Okay, please uh, start your homework, and because uh, I don't want you guys panicking over the weekend here. Okay.